Okay, without further ado then, this next session is going to be on the slightly thorny subject of effective stewardship versus greenwash. So we got told off earlier for using the word stewardship, and in fact it was a word that I was 10 years ago telling people not to use because some of us from our histories know that the term stewardship is actually trademarked to a company that used to be called Friends Provident. But that aside, the word stewardship has taken off, so I use it here, I use it regularly all the time. And generally we're talking about responsible ownership activity and what asset managers do with the assets that they own. So we've got four, four experts with very different perspectives, actually, quite different types of companies. And um, what I want us to really unpick is kind of what does good look like? Because it's very easy for companies to say they're doing stewardship activity or engagement, it's quite different to know that it's actually making any difference or even helping point us in the right general direction. So without further ado, I'm going to ask everyone to introduce themselves and it would help if I had names on, but there you go. So um, maybe Neville, if I could ask you to introduce yourself first, please. Thanks, Julie. I hope everybody can hear me. Hi, I'm Neville White, um, Head of Responsible Investment at Eden Tree Investment Management, which is a boutique uh, equity and fixed interest manager that only does responsible and sustainable investment and ultimately owned by a trust, um, charitable trust, the Benefact Trust. Um, but very pleased to be here in this gorgeous venue um, to be able to talk about greenwash, which is something we're quite passionate about. I thought you might be. <laughs> cool. Um, right, so uh, next speaker, so Alex, if you could introduce yourself, please. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Alex Game. I'm a fund manager and the ESG officer at a firm called Unicorn Asset Management. Uh, we are a specialist UK equity boutique. Uh, UK equity is not necessarily the most popular place to invest at the moment, so we have some interesting insights for anyone that wants to uh, pick me up after to try and you know, champion the UK cause. But in terms of investing, you know, we focus on small caps, so our experience in terms of um, engagement and stewardship is very much investing in some of the smaller companies in the UK, not necessarily household names, but you know, represent a significant proportion of employment. When you look at the environmental and social impact of these businesses, it has a very significant impact on the, the UK wide. Um, so, so in terms of our, our national agenda, you're know, hugely important and a really interesting and exciting area for, for us to invest. So very, very hands-on sort of local investor, if you like. It's, yeah, again, as I say, different perspectives uh, are brilliant. So um, Ben, Ben, sorry, I was originally introduced to you as Climate Ben. Are you still Climate Ben, or are you kind of branched well, I out? I sort of um, oscillate between Climate Ben and Carbon Ben. So carbon Ben, OK. <laughs> That's OK, fair enough. I'll take Climate Ben. Um, <laughs> okay. So yeah, Ben McEwen, I work for Saracen and Partners. Uh, we're a UK-based asset manager. I think, I mean... I think there's two different things about Saracen. One is we're a thematic manager, so we specialize in thematic investing. And we also have a long lineage of charity investments. So I think we're the second or third largest charity manager in the UK, which I think has fostered that dangerous word of stewardship for our clients. <laughs> yes, uh, wide, widening, widening its sense from one fund to, to what everyone should be doing. Yep. Emma, please, would you like to introduce yourself? Or Emma Archie, sorry, beg your pardon, full name. We're in <laughs> formal proceedings here. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Uh, so, hello, I'm Amarachi Siri. I'm a sustainability analyst working at Janice Henderson, specifically on the global sustainable equity strategy. This is a suite of products now that um, focus specifically on sustainable investing. And um, this strategy has been going on now for 31 years. Um, and that's partly due to quite a few of the people in attendance today who have previously worked on the strategy as well. So thank you very much, all of you guys, for helping me to continue to do that good work. Which is how I know that I've been in the industry for more than 25 years, because I was there at the launch. So yes, um, <laughs> there, you, there you go. Um, OK, absolutely, absolutely great. Thank you all for introducing yourselves. Like I say, we've got different, different opinions and different backgrounds and different types of companies. But can we start, first of all, then, by just looking at you know, sustainable funds generally? Um, you know, there are some people who would think a sustainable fund wouldn't need to engage, and there's other people who think it's maybe greenwash if a fund isn't sustainable but does engagement. Can we try and put that in some kind of context, then, about you know, who should and shouldn't engage? Is it... Is it an oxymoron to be running, say, an ethical or responsible sustainable fund and say we need to do engagement? Just, just sort of quick fire to set the sort of baseline here. Maybe Neville, would you like to kick off with that? Well, I think the starting point is that all strategies which label themselves ethical, responsible, sustainable, ESG should have an engagement strategy. So that's a kind of default. 
uh, and across the range of strategies and mandates we, we run, engagement is a core part of that. Now, engagement serves several purposes. But slightly taking the question back and rung, if I may, is, is what do we know or what, do we, or what is it that we don't know? First of all, we, we don't know really what sustainability means, in my view. There is no regulatory definition. There is no market consensus around sustainability. So in a sense, if you've got a sustainability-type product, it's incumbent on the manager that runs that to really define it and say what that product is there to do. But I do believe then that an engagement strategy runs from that because just having the strategy in itself is not enough. If you're doing stewardship, and I imagine most of my colleagues on the panel are signed up stewardship code members, engagement is a real key part <coughs> of how you make a difference, how you build business responsibility, and how you escalate change. Thank you. Alex, would you like to add to that at all? Yes, I mean, for, for us, sustainability is very much about delivering sustainable long-term returns for our, for our clients, for our investors. Um, as long-term investors in, in smaller companies, part of the consideration is will that company be able to operate uh, productively, efficiently in 5, 10, 15 years down the line? Um, so as part of that process, we need to consider how it's interacting with the local community, what impact it's having on the environment, how it's paying its employees, how it's treating its employees. All of these considerations are very important to the, the long-term value creation of those businesses. Some of the challenges of investing in smaller companies is there's not often the, the levels of reporting and disclosure that you get in some of the, the large FTSE 100 businesses, so there may not necessarily be 80, 100-page sustainability reports. So that, for us, is an opportunity to spend time with the management, visit their operations, their factories, their offices, and really try and get a feel for the, the culture, the practices within those businesses firsthand. And that, in turn, provides a really strong platform for, for engagement, <coughs> for you know, identifying areas where those businesses can improve, and then providing a platform to continually monitor um, with the, the, the progress that those companies are making according to some of those few key KPIs that we identify. Which is what so much this is about, isn't it? Measuring it and keeping a track record and seeing, seeing the direction of travel. Um, thank you. Um, shall, we, shall we maybe... Yes, go ahead. One thing, which is to say, I mean, I completely agree with Neville that um, there's a sort of definition requirement incumbent upon asset managers to define what they mean by sustainability. But the premise of sort of excluding all firms or any firms from a given ethical strategy, you know, we know that virtually every business that, that exists has some form of externality associated with it, whether that's social or environmental. So we can't pretend that, you know, society doesn't have externalities. And so it is, I think, incumbent to engage uh, with all types of different firms rather than just saying... Absolutely. So embed it in all strategies. But yeah. yes, and... Um, I mean, I would agree with that very strongly. Um, and I'd go as far as to say, because I work for an active asset management company, um, to do active investing, you kind of have to be engaged in any way, regardless of whether you are a sustainable strategy or not. So when I looked at that, I was like, is it really about sustainability as to whether you're engaging or not, or is it about the type of engagement that you're doing? Because there are plenty of active managers that do really good engagement, it's just not to do it with anything regarding sustainability. And that, that brings me to thinking of, you know, when your Global Care Funds were launched originally, you know, the idea, you know, way back then that it's just business as usual, that investment managers sit down and talk to companies and try and encourage them you know, very often to do with ESG stuff and sustainability. You know, that, that just wouldn't have crossed people's minds at the time. That, it wasn't there. So in the context of all the craziness out there in the world, we have come so far in all of this. Um, so, so maybe let's talk for a moment then on what, um, what perhaps good looks like and what, what you do in your funds. And when, when we talk about stewardship activity, what, what do you actually do and maybe try and compare and contrast that a little bit with something that doesn't work to help bring it to life and help people grasp the subject. But Emma, would you like to start? I think, first and foremost, um, we have an idea of what good looks like to us, but it's worth stating that good in this space is also being defined. 
And it's been defined from multiple different places. You've got the UNPRI also defining what good looks like. You've got various different sustainability labels, the, um, the EU, whatever. They're all defining what good looks like. And all of them are talking really to the same direction, but with very different language. And they all have different nuances in terms of how they want that good to be displayed. So from our perspective, as, a, uh, as Janice Henderson, we are signed up to the stewardship code. Um, and that, that in itself um, is a source of pride for us. But also within the products that I, we work on, we have our own engagement policy. And within that policy, um, just to put some scientific language on it, and apologies for scientific terminology, but it's based around a concept called the quintuple helix innovation model. <laughs> <That's catchy>. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the idea behind it is that because we're engaging for the purpose of change or for the purpose of encouraging innovation, we had to use an innovation model to actually define how we engage. And, the idea, uh, and within that model, we look at industry, we look at um, public sentiment, and we look at academics, and we put an environmental and social overlay on that um, to define how we go about engaging. Now, whether that's the best way to go about it, I, I don't fully know, but at least that is, we've tried to use a scientific approach to get to a solution at least. And I'm sure that other people on the, uh, here will have their own ways of going about engagement and will have equally credible ways, but may have done it slightly differently. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish I had as catchy a term as a quintuple <laughs> helix innovation model. You can't um, find something less catchy. I, I don't think we do at Saracen, but I mean, I, I, you know, I think there's sort of certain core areas that we like to look at or think that um, we can drive positive change and it you know, varies across human capital to climate change. But perhaps two, two examples or sort of drilling down to one is really a, the sort of the um, idea that we need to improve market stability around climate change. So we've done a lot of engagement with firms but also with accountants, auditors, regulatory bodies about the idea of climate change being a sort of a systemic risk and how do we start to engage around that systemic risk. And it's really around driving changes in the way that we report the financial materiality of climate change. So it's really trying to get to that synthesis of driving environmental outcomes and stability outcomes um, with, with those engagement efforts. So engagement doesn't have to be, if you like, downwards to the holdings that you've got, it can be equally upwards to influence the system. Absolutely, yeah. Which is, is brilliant, and, and that illustrates how, how very different the approaches are. The fund managers, as I'm always saying to people, funds, funds vary, fund management houses vary. Um, Alex, would you like to describe what you're talking about, and, and maybe you know, describe companies and, and what, it, what it means to engage with a, a smaller local company? Yeah, sure. So, absolutely agree that there are so many different standards and frameworks around at the moment that it's huge, hugely complex particularly for the companies, and we speak to them all the time. So to try and you know, standardize their reporting structures is, is very, very complex at the moment. So clearly the, the standardization that the FCA are working on, you know, we welcome that, companies will welcome that, because at the moment these, these businesses are being pulled in different directions in many cases. Um, for us, it's a case of you know, clearly there's been a huge amount of progress in recent years in terms of emissions. So pretty much all companies are reporting on emissions now. Many of those companies have net zero policies in place or emissions reduction targets. Um, I think the, the next area of focus will be on the social side of things, the impact on human capital. So you know, that's an area of focus for us. What are the companies doing in terms of treating their workforce correctly, the culture, the standards within their, 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 their organizations? And I think particularly in the current environment where you know, the workforce is suffering a, a cost of living squeeze, yeah, that focus on human capital is, is ever more important. So yeah, that's a really ent interesting area of, of, um, of focus for us and an interesting area of focus for our investee companies at the moment. Cool. And maybe, Neville, what, I mean, you guys do some amazing reports and stuff. Maybe you'd like to use some of those examples. But, but you know, focusing on what, what stewardship looks like from your perspective and what does good look like? Yeah, I think we, we, we try to focus um, on where we can make a difference, where we're aware and humbly aware that the conversations that all my colleagues and everybody in the, in the industry is having has made a huge difference. 
uh, and having been doing this for 25 years, I can sit here and just show you the perspective of what has changed over that quarter century in terms of corporates being responsive, both to regulation, but also to all of the industry initiatives and all my colleagues in the industry that have pressed. What good looks like is not linear. And I think there is a misunderstanding sometimes that you have an engagement and it leads to something. It isn't like that. And a good example is we, we put a lot of focus on engaging with companies to set science-based targets. The rationale being if they do that, they will decarbonize in line with Paris without using offsets. And so we put a lot of focus on that. But a good example is year one, asking this company to do it, we didn't get a response. Year two, there was a terse response. Year three, it's you again, do you really want to talk to us? Year four, we have a conversation, they say they won't do it. By year seven, which was last year, they've set a science-based target. Now, that was partly us sticking in the game for all that time and also being long-term holders. And this is where active investment comes to play. You tend to be long-term holders, not churning uh, for short-term profit. And that conversation with that company for us was a win and is what good looks like because that was an energy company. And so actually them setting an SBT, science-based target, means that that energy company will de decarbonize the portfolio quite significantly for us because it was one of the largest emitters in the fund. So that's one area where good looks like. But we try to focus where we can make a difference, being a fairly small investment management, but also leveraging our expertise over three decades of talking to companies and kind of trying to get under the bonnet from their perspective as well as what we want them to do. I'm not sure, there we go, um, that the empirical evidence for divestment as a tool for increasing the cost of capital of firms, which is what divestment is intended to do, is extremely limited, right? We know that empirically. We know that the academic literature does not support divestment having a substantive effect on that company's cost of capital. So, you know, I, I think that really does speak to the role of the necessity for engagement. Okay, if anyone's happy going off piste a little bit here, because this isn't in the questions, but, but it's an interesting conversation. We're seeing all this activity in, in Texas, basically talking about stopping using various asset managers and putting loads of pressure on people to force them to invest in banks. Is that not indicative of the fact that, sorry, to force them to invest in oil companies? Is that not indicative that there are people out there who are worried about capital being withdrawn? Or is that just kind of them being a bit twitchy a little bit early? Neville, maybe any thoughts on that? Um, I'm probably an outlier here because we've never invested in oil and the fund managers have always correlated those returns <laughs> from alternative parts of the market. So actually in my previous role with the church, I probably spent 60 to 65% of my time purely focusing on oil and mining because they were so high risk, high impact. I don't have that problem now. And actually I do believe that you don't have to invest in oil. Fund managers are not obliged by law, by regulation, to invest in oil. So this idea that you have to in order to get the return is, is, a, is a falsehood. However, what I would say in answer to that is if you're going to hold oil in a sustainability fund, it's incumbent on the manager to say, what is the transition plan? What does it look like? What is the timeline? Is it credible? And if it's none of those things, and I would suggest that none of the American super majors have a credible transition plan, then you don't hold it in a sustainability fund because no amount of engagement will make a difference. So I might be an outlier there. Not, not in my book. <laughs> Emma, what should I say? Um, you're not an outlier. And um, just to put some context onto it, um, it's only because of macroeconomic factors that oil has even started to look decent again. Um, and if you're investing based on short-term things like that, then that, that's not really who the vast majority of the people on this panel are, and it, it, it's not the way that we're, we're going to invest. In terms of um, the, the whole oil and the transition debate and all of this, um, this is one where, this is where the type of engagement and how you engage becomes really important because every company or every company I look at these days is all, everyone says they're sustainable, right? You, you, there is no company that goes, no, we're not sustainable. We don't care about the planet. Even the ones who are messing up the planet say in their brochures that they care about it. 
So the question then is about discernment and really drilling down into what they are putting out and uh, then asking the critical questions as to whether they truly are who they say they, they are or whether they're just trying to spin a yarn. And um, I think this is where our strategy um, is quite unique. Me as a, as a sustainability professional, prior to coming into the finance space, I was a sustainability manager working inside a company. So I know how this, how, how this stuff is made and I have experience of that and I use that experience then to interrogate what I'm seeing from the companies to see, if, frankly, if they're telling me the truth or not. And if I find that they are spinning a yarn and I've had to do quite a few of those engagements this year, I've actually um, said, look, I've read your disclosures. They're not good. <laughs> and I have actually said it like that. I but I've also said, here's the reason why they're not good, because I could spot this, this, and this. And if I can spot it, it means that the Greenpeaces, the Extinction Rebellions, the people who actually really don't want you to, who, who, who are really going to come after you and disrupt business, also can see it, and it's better that you come and uh, sit, sit down with me and let me show you the reasons why you should do this correctly, and let's work together, rather than you continue trying to spin a yarn. Some companies are, are intentionally spinning a yarn. It's also worth stating, and this is where um, being qualified also helps. Some companies are stating things, and it's not because they're intentionally trying to spin a yarn, it's just because they don't know better. And they don't have qualified people in the room. So for a number of years, and I, I, even when I've been on panels like this and I, people have given me looks, I've actually talked about having qualified sustainability professionals working in companies and also working on investment funds. Um, I'm a member of, I'm a full member of IEMA, I'm a chartered environmentalist, and some of that is part of what I use then to do credible engagement. And, I, and, and it's difficult to do that engagement work if you haven't had experience or qualifications. And really, to be honest, a, a good mixture of the two helps. And, that, and that's focusing specifically on the environmental side, and obviously ESG can be, can be wider, but that's brilliant, and I think people are... Well, that's why we're seeing a lot of these teams growing, isn't it? They're bringing in the expertise, a lot of them. Uh, some of us predate any of those kind of exams ever having existed, but, but maybe experience. they do, but I wouldn't have known. But, but yeah, so, <laughs> can, like, I mean, I don't know, actually, to, to me, the difference is, do you actually really care? That's, I mean, being qualified, obviously, you're going to get into the nuts and bolts of it way more than I can. But, but actually, do you really care? Because a lot of people, it's about making money, isn't it? So can we come up with other examples of maybe greenwash and what, what sort of bad practices look like to try and give people here a feel for for really what they should be looking out for. I picked up a great, I think it was a tweet recently from, oh, what's the guy, I've forgotten the guy's name. Anyway, former fund manager, or a current fund manager, but not with a partner, who was saying that they picked up a message from a tobacco company saying that they were meeting one of the SDGs and being incredibly responsible because they'd come up with innovative new tobacco products. I mean, that, that is clearly SDG washing. But can you give a sort of principled idea if you read particular things in a brochure? Sorry, we've got a question here. Yeah, go ahead. Yes? Yep. My question on the green my green media and I've been looking at supply chains. When I look at supply chains where my forests are being deforested. And I follow the supply chain of the minerals. When I look at the minerals and what they're being turned into, it's being turned into solely for electric cars, solar panels, and wind turbines. Greenwashing that's there with tobacco, yeah, of course. But the bigger anomaly is the fact that all 17 SDGs are completely, in my opinion, greenwashed, and it's all in the global south. I think that's a concerted look at insurance risk for cautionary principle. I just wanted to ask about that. I think I think that's a really good point. Let's put it to the panel. So I think I think the issue is that 
you know, things are deeply imperfect at the moment, to put it mildly. Um, so, so examples of bad practices. We, we saw Panorama this week talking about forests in, in, um, in Canada. You know, this, this is happening in so many places. Do we have other examples of it may be to do with the supply chain for EVs, which I, I wouldn't mind betting someone here has probably done a report on at some time. But, I mean, those kinds of things are, are massive, massive issues and very real right now. Do, do we have any thoughts? This speaks to just the complexity around modern supply chains. Um, I had a two-hour conversation with Nestle earlier this week, where, to their, to their you know, credit, their modern slavery statement is not what we usually see, which is a boilerplate, this is what we do, and it's signed by the CEO. It's actually a really detailed report on where they know they have slavery. And it's what they're saying is we have to identify it before we can eradicate it. And they have a particular problem in the Thai seafood industry. They supply or source through a third party, but further down that supply chain, some of the practices around Thai fishing are pretty poor. But it's not just fishing, the gentleman there, forestry. It's, it's how companies go, how far they go down the supply chain and whether they're really on top of those audits and those assurances. You know, even RSPO, the, the responsible sourcing of palm oil, has come into disrepute because is it really sustainable palm oil when we still know forests are being ripped up in Indonesia. And I think in my day-to-day -day world, no subject of more than supply chain exercises conversations with companies. It's the one thing that is the hardest to get a grip on, but also to really assert how much control a Nestle, a Tesco, a Unilever has on some of the underlying third, fourth, fifth tiers of that supply chain. Yeah, thank you. Alex, if you're dealing with smaller UK companies, um, how far do they look through their supply chain? Do you, do you seek reassurances for them that, that they're addressing those kinds of issues? Yeah, so part of the attraction and benefit of investing in smaller companies in general is they tend to have shorter supply chains. So you know, when you're appraising the, the risks within those supply chains, it's very different to what you would do for a, a large global FTSE 100 um, organization. So yeah, that's, that's a, a good starting point. Uh, beyond that, it is scrutinizing where they're sourcing materials from. Um, as part of the fundamental due diligence, you need to look at the margins they're making because you know, clearly if a, a company is operating in a, a low margin segment but making superior margins versus some of their competitors, you have to ask questions as to how they're achieving that. So there are various different mechanisms and tools that you, you can do to ensure that you know, the supply chain is as robust as possible the various different participants in that supply chain are, are being paid accordingly. Um, so that's a, 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 an important area of focus for us. But you know, just to reiterate, that, that shorter supply chain, that less complex supply chain, does make it a lot more easier to con control some of the risks within yeah, smaller company investing. And, and Ben, can I? Yeah, just to the, back to the gentleman's question. I mean, it's incredibly complex, right? So when we think about, I think there's an increasing narrative about the just transition. What does a just transition mean? So just transition is thinking about all stakeholders in society and ensuring that you know, some stakeholders aren't left behind as a function of the transition to a net zero economy. But it, it's incredibly complex when we think about resource extraction, especially from the global south, because there is an element of um, extraction of wealth from those economies at the moment. But we also know that we have to make this transition, right? If we don't make the energy transition, I can see the, the gentleman shaking his head, but in my view, and according to the scientific literature that exists around the transition, unless we make a deep decarbonisation over forthcoming decades, the physical risk manifestation associated with climate change in a three or four degree scenario is incredibly significant for jurisdictions in the global south. It is far more material for those jurisdictions in the global south if we hit three or yeah. four degrees and there's a, a massive socioeconomic cost to those areas if we don't make that transition. But I'll and it's, it's messy. Because people's emotions that renewables are possible to improve so far from the No, no, no. When I've spoken to people in industry, when I've spoken to people in industry, I says, are renewables fossil fuel free? They're laughing. There's, you need to burn coal for every single aspect of the supply chain. There's human rights abuses, there's environmental rights abuses. And I'm, I'm just, and for me, the biggest question here today is when you've got 
Sweetwater, Texas, in the US, which has got 25 square miles of wind turbine waste, stranded assets, what focus, if any, is the companies in this conference looking at stranded asset risk? They've invested in something, yeah. and it's well, just going to be later there. Thank you. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'll be, first and foremost, um, I'm going to declare a more personal interest in this. Um, I, my family are originally from the Niger Delta region in Nigeria, and we've seen personally the effect of this um, from the state that I'm from, which is Abia State, and also from the state that my mom is from, which is Anambra State. And one of the things that I, uh, that I find really difficult in this space is that it, as much as I want to try and do good, I'm finding that there are even peak forces on the ground that are hampering my efforts to actually be able to trace what is going on and be able to sort things out. And also that the, the, to a certain extent, the good guys don't necessarily want to work with us. So here, here's my, here, I'll give you an example that I've given at this place, uh, at this conference before. We've done a lot of engagement in cobalt in the DRC, and that's where two thirds of the world's cobalt comes from, right? However, we, we, we speak to an NGO that, specif that, that specifically looks at the, the rights of children in the, DR, in the DRC. The fact that I can't name that NGO that we are working with is part of the problem. Because com uh, um, com uh, charities and NGOs don't want to be associated with investors, even sustainable ones like us. And it, I think there is a... It would be nice if some of the people who are on the ground making a difference could actually partner up with us so that we could get a bit more transparency so that when I go and speak to the Microsofts and the Teslas of this world, I'm actually able to say, well, I know that what you're saying is not entirely true because I've got people on the ground who have told me it's not true. And therefore, I would love you guys to start doing things differently and work with us in terms of making those changes. But right now, I don't even have that. And then on top of that, the governments in some of these countries are falsifying paperwork to make it also hard for me to do that kind of stuff. So yeah, with everything that you're saying, I am really sympathetic and I want to do better and I don't think we've got it right yet. But some, some of this stuff is not fully within our control. Some of it, you, there is a responsibility also by the governments that are in these countries to stop falsifying paperwork, stop putting children in these places, and then lying to the Western companies and say, when they come toward it and say, oh no, there's no children here. We've seen that as well. You know, there, there, there's, there's a level of responsibility all around. And, I'm with anybody who's here who can actually help us. I'm willing to have those conversations offline and let's, get, let's at least work towards more credible solutions. So I, I, obviously I don't know who you are, but I think you'll find a lot of us here in this room, those of us that just do this stuff, have been quite cognizant of those problems for quite a long time. And the question you're asking, it's not the first time I've been asked it, right? There are people who know this. The question is, what on earth do we do about it? And so get talking to people that are the fund managers here. You know, get building those alliances, because likewise, you know, antiretroviral drugs, getting them out to, to Africa you know, years ago. The, we, friends probably who I was with at the time, the, the charities we were working with didn't want to be named again. And, and you know, there's so much that Emma's saying there is exactly right. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult, difficult area. So you know, for the advisors in the market, recognize that you know, behind the scenes, but we're all doing different things, but there's so much other stuff that goes on that, that can make stuff really difficult as you go through the process, even with the best intentions. But this, again, comes back to the benefits of the SDR and the regulatory changes that we were talking about this morning, which is about that transparency and getting people to know that if you've got a fund that... I'm, I now know I'm allowed to use the word improver. So if you've got a fund which is an improver and they recognise that there are problems in their supply chain, but they are being worked on and we are doing this, this and this, and then you've got the scrutiny of people to be able to go back and say, actually, that's not quite enough. So, so just, I think that's, hopefully that's put that on, you know, settled your mind a little bit that there is work that goes on this kind of stuff. Um, 
But yes, yeah, so let's, let's bring it back to sort of where we, where we draw the line on when engagement works, when it doesn't work. And, and actually coming back to this a little bit, you know, at what point do you go, engagement's over, this is game over, this is just nonsense. Bearing in mind that we are talking about investors here and we've got to keep money in the system and we want to use our power as investors to encourage companies to do good things. You know, where, where do we draw the line? Where are the pinch points? How, how do you approach that, Neville? Um, yeah, I think having a cogent um, and well thought through divestment process is really important because where the relationship between, if you like, investors and, um, and the Extinction Rebellion type people breaks down is... Okay, you keep telling us you're engaging, but what is the timeline for change? When will you stop engaging and realize you can't make a difference? So the first thing I'd say is, is having that divestment discipline is important. Um, we've divested from, from a number of things over, over, the, over the years, and a very recent example, which was in the news quite, quite a lot e even here, but especially in Sweden, um, was the revelations that Ericsson had been paying bribes to terrorists in Iraq. Now, that's one of those things that flashes on your, across your desk on a Monday morning, and you realize you've got to go into full throttle reactive mode immediately because it's so serious. So from hearing about that, you put a stop on the investment, you have a meeting with the company, and you make a decision. And within 48 hours, the entire team had decided to divest. That's quite unusual, but having that divestment um, kind of robustness is really important. And we realized with the, the, the quality of the meeting we had with Ericsson was poor and not enough to reassure us that they were on top of this and therefore we exited. And actually between us exiting and more news flow coming out, the share price fell another 14%. And so we shielded investors from that middle share price discount. So I think it's mostly around having a divestment and engagement is really important. We've all stressed that. But there does come a part time with an Exxon say um, and I'm looking cheekily at my colleagues in the Church of England who have engaged and engaged and engaged with Exxon over the years. There has to come a time when you say enough is enough when you're out. Thank you. Alex? Yes, I mean, we, in terms of engagement, it's a fluid process, which is often the case. So you can set aside some a framework, some targets at the, the start of an engagement. But often what you find is over the course of time, um, that may change, it may evolve. Um, for us, it's just important to see progress. So, you know, one of the key areas of engagement for, for us, looking at smaller companies, is improved reporting and disclosure. Because it's very well known that smaller companies do not have the resources of, of large companies to communicate some of the good work that they're doing. So, that for us is a, is a key focus to try and improve that level of reporting disclosure. Um, clearly, as an industry standard, it's expected. Um, some companies are behind the curve. Um, and when it comes down towards you know, the work they're doing on emissions, the work they're doing at the, the local level, the social community work, you, know, you need data to monitor that progress. So we need to see the data, we need to see progress to the KPIs that they're setting out in their reports. And I think for us, we need to, we see, we need to see progress on the ground. So when we visit their, their factories, their operations, there's usually very clear evidence whether the companies are, are taking these things seriously or not. Yeah, so that can lead us to, to That's one thing you can do as a UK investor, isn't it? Go out and see them exactly. and go and look at what they're doing. Ben? Yeah. I, I mean, I think, you, you, to, to Neville's point, you need a, an engagement strategy and a divestment strategy that are, that are linked with one another. And you also need an investment strategy that is interlinked with both of those things. So as investors, we have to think about the risks to our clients' capital and the ability of that capital to generate returns over the long term in a sustainable way. And if we're not getting comfort that our capital is protected for our clients or the returns are protected, then there's a significant risk. So perhaps you know, the most apposite example I'd give is two industrial gas companies that both had very high emissions profiles. One starts to deploy the capital that it is generating into hydrogen-based technologies. One starts to deploy its capital towards steam, methane, or coal, gas, coal gasification projects in China. Coal gasification is one of the most emissions-intense energy sources that you can feasibly imagine. Um, and you know, for that reason, our perspective was that the company that was allocating our clients' capital towards a very emissions-intensive activity that faced significant stranded risk was a risk to our clients' capital, and so we divested from that firm but then continue to help hold the firm with the analogous carbon footprint as it is today because we see that transition happening over time. So it's really focusing about <coughs> engagement, divestment, and what the investment thesis is around the risk to sustainability. OK, 
Okay. Emma? Um, so, yeah, I'm going to say something that's fairly unique, I would say, um, to um, us. We aim to invest with, uh, and to invest in companies where we don't want to ever have to divest. And, the, uh, uh, and certainly not have to divest for ESG reasons. So we have um, very stringent criteria for what actually goes into our portfolios in the first place. And one of the key um, aspects of us even wanting to invest in a company is for the purpose of being able to engage with them and have those conversations. And it, it, if we're not able to do that, we then don't enter that position. However, there, are, there, there have been a couple of occasions, very few over the last five years, where we have divested for ESG reasons. And the big reason um, for us as to why that has happened is because we found that the company just kept lying to us. Um, and, that's, and, and trust is actually a really important part of this. We want to, we, we're, we're not activists. We're not um, saying to a company, we're not looking to beat them with the sustainability stick and say, you will improve or else. But um, what we do want to say, what we do want is to have an active conversation with them to find out where their pain points are and to actually see whether we can help them with some of the knowledge that we have in house and also share knowledge from some of the other companies that we invest in. Um, where they've got it right and say, actually, we've got an example here of a company that we invest in that had this problem. They've done this. Do you want to try that out? Well, we could potentially link you up. And we've done that in, in the past, especially in regards to carbon. So um, we, we, we invest in a very large um, IT company um, and they... Um, had a, they have an ambition to become carbon negative by 2030. I'm sure that some of you can guess who that is. We had a look at their science and, um, you know, they, they were quite honest and said, we haven't got all the answers yet as to how we're going to get there. But this is the scientific approach that we're taking. And um, they shared with us some of the people that they're using to try and help them down that approach and as a result and we asked them okay can we share this with some of the other companies that we invest in and they said yes so we've been doing that and um, I think that that's equally as valuable as some of the other stuff that gets done with regards to engagement as well. Yep. Absolutely I think again one of the well two key points to come out from that one is who would have guessed that companies lie eh? I mean, trust, it's, it's a massively important thing and it cuts right the way through, which is why that's a big theme of SDR and trying to improve trust in our industry and you know, reflecting on the comments that were made by gentlemen earlier. You know, we, we need to get ourselves open, transparent, so people know what we're doing, why we're doing. Um, and I've completely lost the other thought I was going to say, so we'll, we'll have to abandon that one. Um, so I'm going to finish on a quick-fire question on this because I want to wrap up very, very quickly. Um, quick show of hands, then. Um, Again, openness, transparency, whatever, but a fund that's labelled sustainable or ethical, whatever it is that, you're, that you run, the names that you got for them, which of the following industries um, do you exclude? So first off, uh, tobacco companies. Right. Coal, oil and gas companies. Right. Um, mining companies. And how about one for, for our new prime minister? How about fracking? Yeah, okay. So, so you're seeing here, we have differences in opinion, but there's things where there's the general direction of travel. Um, I'm going to call it quits on this session. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, we could carry on this conversation forever. We could, there's so much to talk about Nigeria and everything. But anyway, let's, let's, let's stay clear of that. And with that, I would like you to thank this panel. <laughs>